Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Triangulation is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Triangulation, episode 313, recorded September 11th, 2017. Chris Melisinos. This episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Qualcomm Snapdragon Gigabit LTE. To make the most of your unlimited data plan, go to snapdragon.com slash gigabit. And by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Home plays a big role in your life. That's why Quicken Loans created Rocket Mortgage. It lets you apply simply and understand the entire mortgage process fully so you can be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. Get started at rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. And by WordPress. Your customers want to find you. Build a WordPress.com website and help them connect with your business. Get 15% off any new plan purchase at wordpress.com slash triangulation. Welcome to Triangulation. This is the Twitch show where we look back at the luminaries, the men and women who have created this world of technology that you enjoy so much. I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the digital Jesuit in for Leo Laporte. And we have a special honor today. We get to speak with Mr. Chris Melisinos. Now, if you know anything about the video game industry, you, you may have heard his name before, and that's because he's been part of it. He's one of the leaders of the Java community. He was the chief evangelist and chief gaming officer for Sun Microsystems. He created Sun's Game Technologies Group and was one of the driving political forces behind Project Dark Star and bindings for OpenGL and OpenAL and Jinput. He's currently the director of corporate strategy for media and entertainment at Verizon. Chris, thank you very much for joining us on Triangulation. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me on the show. Uh, I think the very first time I ever saw you was at a panel at either CES, or back when it was still called the Consumer Electronics Show, or sure. E3. Um, and you were talking about oh massively multiplayer online games and, and how you've seen them advance throughout history. But your history with video games starts way before MMOs. Oh, absolutely. So it was, yeah, if it was CES or E3, it was probably late 90s, early 2000s when, I mean, online games have been around for quite a number of years, but the world was really just starting to discover massively multiplayer games and online games in a bigger way. And, uh, you know, there were a couple of us kind of kicking around some of the larger technology companies saying, hey, you know, there are some things that we can really do from a technology and platform perspective that could massively accelerate and create, you know, incredible opportunities to build at scale, very large worlds. And uh, so since that period of time, I'd been focused on trying to do whatever I could to make video games better for people who make them and people who play them. And in fact, the industry has recognized your contributions. In 2013, at the uh, Game Developers Choice Award, you were awarded the honor of ambassador. And that's only given out to people who have elevated the state of the video game industry. So there's, there's, there's a long time recognition that your work throughout history in the video game industry hasn't just pushed more product or pushed more unit, but you've actually changed it. You've, you've, you've made it more of an art. Well, so that, you know, that award was unbelievable and, and again, incredible honor to receive that from the industry. You know, it's important to remember that it's not, it wasn't my work. You know, it, these are not games that, that I make or had made. It was me finding the right people with the same amount of passion that wanted to go ahead and make sure that we established video games as an art form, that we established them as a permanent and important part of society. And so being able to help elevate the work that my colleagues and friends have been basically dedicating their lives to was one of the most absolute greatest privileges of my career and was so happy to be able to kind of, uh, you know, lead the charge for establishing games as a legitimate art form. Okay, so I want to talk all about that. I want to talk about games as an art form. I, w I also right. really want to geek out with you on some of the technologies that were developed at Sun Microsystems. But before sure. that, we've got a very savvy audience. We've got, a, I'm going to say, a geek cultured audience. And they're going to want to know your bona fides. I mean, we know that you are 
very closely tied with the video game industry, that your history mm -hmm. parallels the video game history in the Silicon Valley. But let's, let's go back to your early life. So much of your time has been spent with video games. We have to ask, where were you exposed? When did you get the bug? When did you start realizing video games are what I want to do? All right, so this one, how much time do we have? Because right, <laughs> this could be an incredibly long and drawn out conversation. So uh, it just so happens that I'm, you know, uh, recording this or, or being on your, I'm on your show here from my home office, which has all of my uh, or most of my game systems and and content inside of it. My wife, who's extraordinarily patient, let some of it kind of eke out, but I got to keep most of it in here. So here's the cool thing, okay? Out of frame for one second. Uh oh. Uh oh. Right, right. Uh oh. I so, think I'm about to get geek jealous. All right, here we go. So, if you ask where my history started, it was right oh, here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We got to right. love that. So, so, this is my original Commodore VIC 20. You kept it. Oh. I kept it. Um, and uh, it is still, it still has that, uh, that, uh, you know, incredible uh, plastic smell, including open capacitors. Kids, by the way, don't jam your fingers into this <laughs> thing while it's plugged in because you will get shot. <laughs> but I got exposed to video games through computers in the late 1970s, early 1980s when I was living in New York. Well, and I started, pro you yeah. know, started programming on trash 80s in the elementary school. Oh. But when I got that VIC-20, that was it. That's where I knew my I would want to spend my life is working with computers and building games. Well, for me, it was the TI the uh, 994A. That that was yep. the machine that really got me into the programming bug. But I, I have to ask, you've got that. Do you also have the cassette adapter so that you could store your programming? Not only do I have the cassette adapter, uh, but uh, you know, at the time that we were gifted this this Vic 20, uh, you know, for Christmas. We didn't. We couldn't afford the cassette adapter. Oh, of course. So every day we'd have to turn it back on, type in programs out of Compute Gazette, and play these, you know, horribly janky versions of Pac-Man or or uh, Space Invaders. And they were astonishingly beautiful because we were literally typing into existence these games. They didn't exist in the machine. And for a kid, when you when you hand a child. Um, who at the time, you know, at 10, 11 years old, you, I didn't have control over anything in my life, what to eat, what to wear, you know, uh, when to go to sleep. But inside of that computer, I could be whoever I wanted to be. I could create the stories that I wanted to create. And so being able to type those games into existence was fascinating and empowering and just completely ignited my imagination about what computers could be. That, that was something, and I know this is going to sound nostalgic and it's going to sound like a bunch of old guys yelling for the kids to get off our lawn, but there, there was something to be said about not being able to play something unless you created it. You brought it to life. It, it wasn't readily available. You didn't buy a cartridge and jam it in and, and play for the next 15 hours. You had to program it, and it really made people think about what makes a good game. Uh, and, and it allowed you to change it and, and, and make it better. And I really think that the video game industry as we know it would not have happened if we didn't have that first generation who just started thinking, I wonder if it's possible for me to do X or Y or Z. Right. Um, I, no, I, that, yeah. that, I mean, that's exactly right. I mean, and all technology kind of follows the same path, right? It's the tinkerers first. And it's, the, it's the people who kind of apply their imagination to the technology of the day and try to understand what these tools mean when we try to express ourselves through them, right? And games are a natural uh, form in which to do this because they're fun. I mean, it, playing games is part of being human, right? So what better way to teach the complexities of computer systems in the 1970s to the general public than through video games? Because they're non-threatening, because you want to be able to play them. And so you kind of go through these uh, go through the motions and and apply yourself to things that were typically more complex than you'd been used to seeing or, or have access to in a way that was not threatening and exciting. I mean, it, look, if they came to us at you know, 10, 11, 12 years old and said, program this spreadsheet application or let's go build a database back and you go, OK, well, what? But if it's about taking the Dungeons and Dragons game that you were playing on pen and paper and trying to emulate that inside of a digital format, well, that's amazing, right? That is astonishing because you are igniting a universe that sits behind glass, 
right inside of the television. And you you can't touch it, but you can affect it. And you can pick up that game and take that universe to your friend's home. It was amazing, right? It was as close to magic as we had ever seen. And it was awesome. It was just awesome. I remember the first time that I created a game and saved it to a cassette and then made copies of that cassette so that I could give it to my friends who also yeah. had similar setups. And it, there was that sense of, yeah, I'm proud of this. I want you to play it. And then they'd come back and inevitably they have horrible, horrible words for what I've created because, you know, I didn't do a good job of, of, of taking what was in my head and putting it on screen. But that made me a better programmer and a better designer. Oh, I, I need to ask you this, though. Sure. When, you, when you look at something like the VIC-20 or the C64 or the, the 994A or even, say, the Atari 20, uh, 5200, those were mm -hmm. semi-general purpose computers that you could program to do gaming. But right. what was your first gaming console? It's a machine that was dedicated only for gaming, not for programming, something that was more of a consumer item rather than a programmer item. So, I mean, the very first console that most of us growing up in that era, so I should mention, I was born in 1970, right? So I'm of a generation that I call the bit baby generation yes. because we were, the, right, the first mm -hmm. kids that had computers in the home and they came into our home in in the guise of games, right? So, or under the guise of games. So uh, mine, of course, was a uh, Sears uh, Pong clone, <laughs> right? And then uh, then we saved for an Atari VCS. It was yes, the VCS kids, became the 2600 later, um, and uh, played that on a 12-inch black and white television. And yes, kids, the TVs were only black and white at, some, at one point. And uh, it was amazing. It was just amazing. So the VCS is really the first cartridge-based system uh, that we had access to at home. And it was um, astonishing. Uh, that's also where I started. But I, I do remember, I can read about it now historically and, and see all the analysis about what caused the big crash. But mm -hmm. I, I remember playing with the VCS and then playing with the 2600 and thinking, oh, this is amazing. This is cool. But then there were a couple of years of dropout. And during those couple of years, more and more of us started going to arcades because there just wasn't much that you could get at home or it just didn't look good. It didn't compare well. And then there was mm -hmm. the Nintendo Entertainment System, and that reignited right. the video game industry. Tell me, what was that like for you, for someone who was already starting to get into this, someone who was already starting to, to realize the, the potential for the video game industry? What was the Ness to you? Well, I mean, so b before I jump into the Ness answer, you know, that window of time in the early 1980s, from about 82 to 85, 86 in the US, um, you know, there is the notion that, yeah, the video games industry crashed. And really what they mean is the cartridge-based video game console industry receded. Mm -hmm. Because at the time, there was such a glut of, of games that made their way into market that were just terrible quality games. But people couldn't discern what was good or bad based on box art or what the, you know, the clerk at the store was selling behind the counter. But it's not as if people stopped playing video games. Because remember what happened during that very same period was the rise of the personal computer. And what was the number one application? Video games. So people stopped playing on Atari and Intellivision and ColecoVision, and they moved to the Apple II, to the Commodore 64. And so we didn't stop playing. We just shifted where we were playing because now we had these more powerful computers that came into the home. And our, and our parents said, well, we'll get these for you because they're also educational. Sure, whatever, right? Whatever you need to do to make yourself feel better about it. But the NES came back into the marketplace and really reignited the cartridge-based um, console market in the United States. And they did it um, brilliantly because what they folk, they understood what the problems were that consumers had. They didn't understand what was good or bad. So Nintendo created the Nintendo seal of quality that went on to each box. So you knew it was fresh when you opened it. And remember, they had positioned this system not as a video game console, but as a family entertainment system. So just by choosing their words carefully, choosing a very thoughtful design, and you mentioned, right, the, the NES. I have the NES Classic sitting right over here to my left. Um, so when you ask what its impact was, I'm still playing it to this day, right, in 2017. Um, but again, it completely changed the the way we looked at video games again. We looked at them more as general family entertainment, and it opened up this massive um, possibility space with regard to creating these larger worlds in which to explore. Case in point, Super Mario Brothers, 
right? The first time we saw this massively expansive side scrolling, sprawling adventure world that we could traverse and try to tease out its secrets. So it was earth shattering, right? For those of us that were playing at the time. I had a very similar experience to you of thinking that there was something special about the NES or something about the, the games, about the quality, about the experience. But history has not been kind to Nintendo from those years in that they were looking at their business practices and there's a lot of accusations that there were some shenanigans going on. Uh, for example, the fact that manufacturers, third parties, had to buy their cartridges from Nintendo at an inflated right. price. And mm -hmm. Nintendo decided whether or not to publish a game. If, if you spent the development money on creating uh, an immersive video game and Nintendo decided that it wasn't up to their seal of approval, they just didn't let you sell it. Um, That's and, right. And they, they were really the first serious DRM system uh, on the market in the video, <laughs> video game industry where they made, you know, they made it very difficult for you to try to get, the, get onto the platform if you didn't have that seal of approval. And yet, as you've already pointed out, that all came from Nintendo analyzing what had happened to the video game industry and the, the things that dragged down quality on, say, the Atari 2600 and then trying to remove it. That's right. In, in, a, in a way, people say that mirrors what Apple did with their app store. Uh, a lot of the same measures, some people think it's draconian, and yet they've created a better experience overall. How do you judge it? If you were to look back at Nintendo, how would you say they handled the 80s and 90s? I would say that the success, part of the success that Nintendo had of reintroducing video games into the United States was absolutely built on the back of kind of content constraint. And because they understood that this was a very real pain point for people. And it caused the collapse of companies, which is also why the industry, by and large, said, okay, we're fine with this for right now. Consider the fact that, you know, there were more ET cartridges made than there were it's so ET, it's ET oh, and Pac-Man, right? Cartridges yeah. made. Then there were consoles that were actually sold into the market at that time, because you know the the manager that was uh, that were running Atari at the time said, "Hey, you know, we're just going to go ahead and manufacture these cartridges because we know people are going to want to play them, except for the fact that people didn't want to play them and they wound up returning them." Now, you go back and you take a look at games like ET and Pac-Man, and for their era, for their time, given the constraints that these developers had to create these games. They were actually phenomenal pieces of software, right? And it isn't until you're able to kind of look back at a game like E.T. and truly understand that this is a world that actually existed on a six-sided cube. And you had to wrap your head around that. It's really hard to convey those thoughts through the rudimentary platform that was the VCS or the Atari 2600. So, you know, Nintendo, as we just said, you know, saw those pain points and understood that this is what it was going to take to kind of bring parents back and get them at a comfort level where they're willing to spend $30, $40, $50 on a game, plus the $200 on this control deck, as they called it, right? Or as parents called it, we never called it that, um, <laughs> it back into their homes. So I think that it was the right place, right time with the right model until the market became comfortable again. And what winds up happening is, right, as all technology, good technology does, is that if it is successful, if it's meaningful, if it, had in, if it has impact, it will attach itself in society and will continue to grow and move horizontally and move everybody forward. So that's why we saw, you know, other companies come in with similar practices, but maybe not so closed until it continues, the funnel continued to widen and widen and widen until you have basically, you know, open, mostly open platforms, um, or at least from a developer standpoint, the ability to get your content out to those platforms almost unimpeded. Oh, Chris, I, now, I, wanna... now, now, I I'm saying, because now you just triggered another thought, uh -oh, which no. is, uh -oh. so you remember, you know, so people had to go ahead and limit um, the, the amount of uh, companies had to limit the amount of games that they could bring to market. And I believe it was four games. It was either three or four games in a calendar year. So what Nintendo allowed certain companies like Konami to do was to create a second company, like Ultra Games, and release another three or four cartridges in the same calendar year. So there were always ways to kind of fool around in that system and be able to get more, more games out than were allowed by, you know, the, um, uh, by the rules at that time. I, I do want to talk a little bit about that because specifically yeah. I, I want to talk about a move that some third parties tried to make to get around that and how Nintendo mm. was able to bring its retail might to, to quash it. So 
Can we get to that in just a bit? I, I need to take a break to, to thank a sponsor of Triangulation. Absolutely. All right. So, folks, I hope you're enjoying our discussion with Chris Melisinos about the early stages of the video game industry. Of course, he's been a luminary. He's been so much a part of your experience of video games. But uh, let's take a moment to thank a sponsor of this episode of Triangulation. And actually, I'm very proud that it's Qualcomm. Now, this episode of Triangulation is brought to you by Qualcomm's Snapdragon Gigabit LTE. And it lets you stream and download what you want when you want at maximum speeds. A Snapdragon Gigabit LTE was designed to deliver the fastest mobile connectivity and help speed things up in crowded places. Imagine that. When you go into a crowd, when you are surrounded by people all accessing your devices at the same time, you just expect a slowdown. You expect things to get jammed. In fact, most of us expect things not to work at all. But what if you had a technology that not only gave you more bandwidth, but used the RF spectrum more efficiently? That's exactly what Qualcomm did with Snapdragon Gigabit LTE. With additional lanes for your data to flow on and the ability to squeeze more speed from each LTE connection, Snapdragon Gigabit LTE is like driving on a much wider, much faster data highway. Average LTE download speeds are up to seven times faster than typical home Wi-Fi. It can turbocharge all of your connected apps. You could download the latest games from the Play Store on the go, perhaps faster than you can over your Wi-Fi connection at home. You can access all of your files in the cloud nearly as fast as you would if they were stored on your phone. And if you're getting into Android instant apps, you can actually load them instantly. Snapdragon Gigabit LTE technology uses the network much more efficiently so that you'll be leaving plenty of room on the network for others to make the most of their data plans as well. Folks, if you are interested in the next generation of wireless, if you want to see your next device be more efficient in how it uses RF spectrum, if you want to get an instant access, an instant experience from your mobile device, then you need to check out Qualcomm's Snapdragon Gigabit LTE. Make the most of your unlimited data plan. To learn more about epic download speeds for all of your apps, visit snapdragon.com slash gigabit. That's snapdragon.com slash gigabit. And we thank Qualcomm Snapdragon Gigabit LTE for their support of Triangulation. We're speaking with Chris Melisinos. He is a visionary in the video game industry who was just uh, about to tell us about his uh, younger days in arcades. I, I have to ask this first, before we go into the, the whole Nintendo Walmart conspiracy. Were you big in arcade games as well, or were you mostly a, a home player? Oh my goodness. So uh, here's the back case of my <laughs> phone, right? My custom Robotron case, which by the way, greatest arcade game ever made, Robotron 2084. Uh, yes, um, yes. Huge, huge arcade nerd. In fact, I had the very first uh, bike that I ever bought with my own money stolen because I forgot to lock it up while I was in the back of a delicatessen in Queens, New York, playing Pengo. Yep. yep. So, uh, you know, sad day for the bike, but uh, crushed that Pengo score. So <laughs> it was it was all right. Trade so absolutely. Yeah, video games, uh, home or or uh, in the arcade, all about it. In a way, though, the the ever present tension between the arcade and the home console really kind of it. it Threw a, a cast a shadow on the early video game industry. I, I, I remember this. I remember playing Pac-Man in the arcade and thinking it was an incredible game. Oh, my goodness. And then I saw that they had Pac-Man for the Atari 2600. And I'm thinking, oh, this is wonderful. And I justified it to my parents thinking, I'll never have to go to an arcade again. I can play Pac-Man at home. And as you said, it was an amazing piece of software f for the hardware limitations of the time. But to go from playing Pac-Man in an arcade to playing Pac-Man on the 2600 was a jarring experience. And it was one of those moments of, this is not nearly as good as the one I played. The sounds and the graphics are just not there. And neither was the excitement. Was that part of, uh, of the video game decline in the 80s and early 90s when people started to realize the hardware is just not there yet? I don't know if if I if I would agree with that, and, and I'll tell you why. So here's the question: You got that Pac-Man game, and did you play the heck out of it at home? Uh, yes, I did. Okay, right, we we did because we knew that the systems that we had at home were um, sort of like the arcade or bring the arcade excitement home, uh, but we knew it wasn't going to be exactly the same thing. I think the biggest, uh, you know, when you take a step back and you look at really what arcades were. There were places for you to hang out with your friends. There were places where you'd meet, you know, 
cute girls if you know by hanging out watching you play play these games it's it's stuff that you did in between um roller skating sessions or bowling alley you know bowling games and so it was really about the physicality of arcades during that era consider the fact that we had never had access to computers or technology in any other way shape or form before arcade games emerged so most people, before even home games, they experienced video games by touching a Pong machine or an early Space Invaders machine or a Pac-Man machine. And as I said you know, earlier, uh, these were entirely encapsulated, each of them a universe behind glass. And for all intent and purposes, they shouldn't have existed, right? Because right. In, those, in those games, you were something that you could not be in, in this world. So they captured your entire imagination. We knew the game systems at home really couldn't replicate it, but the great thing, especially about kids when they're playing it, is we fill in those gaps with our imagination, right? Which is why, you know, when you look at the oldest video games, you know, home games, there's a reason why Atari cartridges came with elaborate box art and comic books, because they had to describe for you the battlefield that you were about to go ahead and enter when you saw the, you know, the couple of blocks with a line sticking out of them. And, oh, those are the tanks that are on the front cover of this. And this giant war scenario of missile command is really now these lines coming down to, you know, try to kill these blobs at the bottom of the screen. I don't believe it was the, um, the disparity between arcades and home consoles that caused that decline. It was really that people were, companies were making video games that were just terrible games. Yeah putting them into market and consumers didn't know what was good or bad. So how long can you go ahead and continue to buy software that's terrible at $30 a pop before you start going, why am I wasting my money here? And that was really the cause of the decline. Although I do remember the release of the Neo Geo, uh, which uh. was, I mean, it was an incredible piece of hardware, but essentially you were buying a brand new arcade game every single time you bought a cartridge. So it was a little economically unfeasible, but it did- six. Oh. Eight, what, $700 machine, and each of the games were between $300 and $700 <laughs> because they literally took, for those of you that don't know that are watching, they literally took arcade PCBs and they were just folded in half and stuck in a cartridge about yep. you know the size of a, of a large hardback book. And you bought these games home and plugged it in, but it was arcade perfect because, as you just said, you were literally buying an arcade machine and bringing it home with each game that you bought. Yeah. Amazing technology, and it looked fantastic. I had a friend who had one, uh, but yeah, when I was looking at the price, I said, no, "That's not no, <laughs> that that's never yeah, going to happen." Yeah, we all I'm sorry. had that one friend that had it, right? Of the course. rest of us, no. But that one guy, yeah, he had a lot of friends. Now, I do want to move on to uh, your your time with Sun because I think that was formative, sure. not just of your career, but also of many of the games that we enjoy today. But before we get there, one last bit from the Nostalgia Bank, and that is the suit, the, the scuffle that Nintendo had with a third party, and I, I won't name them, maybe, maybe you will, uh, that had developed a workaround for Nintendo's DRM. Uh, back then, it wasn't known as DRM, and back then, there was no law preventing you from cracking any system to play on the Nintendo Entertainment System, but they had done it, and yes. Nintendo realized that they couldn't really go after them legally. It wasn't, wasn't something that was clear-cut as it would be today. So instead, they used their retail pressure. They spoke to their retailer, the big retailers, and said, if you stock these games from this manufacturer, you just may not get your allotment of Nintendo Entertainment Systems. What, what's your rec recollection of those years? So, um, so we're talking about Atari yes. and uh, Tengen. Right. Mm. So, um, yes, they they did apply some retail pressure, but in fact, they were able to go ahead and uh, actually apply the judicial system to solving this problem uh, at the time. Oh, so for those of you, again, that, that may not be aware. So in Nintendo cartridges, there is a, um, a chipset that basically speaks to the chipset inside of the Nintendo. When it has this handshake, it understands it's an official cartridge and um, then it will go ahead and play inside of the unit. So that's why you had to buy the cartridges from Nintendo, apart from the fact that that's how Nintendo also generated significant revenue, right? So what had happened was, um, as the story goes, um, Atari wanted to manufacture their own games without having to go through this system. And so they, uh, I believe it was one of the attorneys that was looking into this went to um, 
the patent office and said they needed to see the patents that were filed for this technology by Nintendo because of an impending lawsuit, which wasn't true. And they wound up basically getting to look at how those chips were made. And they took that information back and Atari basically built their own workaround uh, and created their own chips and basically bypassed the protection system. Now, as you pointed out, this is before we had things like digital rights management and we had uh, you know, um, laws that prevented you from decrypting or breaking encryption for consumer or commercial products. Um, however, it did infringe on their copyright. And so they were able to take them to court and actually have those cartridges pulled. And that's why when you look at two different versions of Tetris, for example, um, one by Tangen, one by Nintendo, it's arguable which, arguable which one is the best, but one of them certainly uh, captures a whole lot more money on eBay than the other one does. <laughs> it was an interesting <laughs> chapter of the video game industry, but I do want to move on to the next one. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about your employment with Sun Microsystems. So I, I know there's an entire generation of Twit viewers who may only know Sun Microsystems in passing, but when the internet was really developing and when Silicon Valley was really coming into its own, Sun Microsystems was a beacon. They used to have a slogan, we put the dot in, in dot com. They Sorry. were the powerful workstations that everyone wanted to use. They had the software that was the most stable, the, the most business oriented. They, they were really a, a futuristic company at a time where we didn't understand how the future would lead to the internet. What was the start of your involvement with Sun? So personal or professional? Uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> That's right. Um, so let's start with the professional side. So uh, in 1994, I started working at Sun Microsystems in the North Virginia, Washington, D.C. area. And I was the first district sales support representative for the commercial business. So that meant I made copies and I assembled presentations and made sure the coffee pot was always filled. But it was any foot that I could get in the door to this incredible company that was blazing the trail forward for what eventually people would understand as the World Wide Web, right? And its application and, and, and its underpinnings from a technology standpoint. Um, I very quickly moved up the ranks into the sales organization and uh, was working, you know, building systems for the military and for NASDAQ and and all that kind of great stuff and working in the channels organization and did that for a number of years. And then at one meeting, uh, one internal sales meeting, I watched Bill Joy stand on stage and demonstrate a brand new technology called Genie. And the idea behind Genie was that you could take any device and plug it into a network and it would identify its capabilities to any other device on that network and you'd be able to use it. So for example, if a printer was suddenly plugged into the network, every computer would see it as a device that prints on paper and it prints at this resolution and it's full color. You didn't need to know that it was an HP, whatchamacallit, or a Panasonic you know, thingamajig. So no drivers, everything instantly talking to each other. So being a gamer, what's the first thought I had? If I could plug a Sega Saturn and a PlayStation into the same network, I could double the market for a developer. So I literally jotted down these original thoughts in a Palm Pilot, which I still have. <laughs> and uh, you know, during one of the breaks, I made a beeline down to find John Gage, who was the chief science officer at the time. And is also the person who is credited with coming with the tagline that network is the computer and started rapidly explaining why this would be so important. And it was from that original presentation, that original thought, that I started putting together a business plan and a strategy for Sun Microsystems to go pursue the games industry. And I shopped that for two years inside of the company to no avail, right? Because as you pointed out, we were the dot and dot com and 89 or 90% of the world's internet traffic went through Sun computers and we couldn't make them fast enough uh, for the orders that were coming in. So nobody wanted to talk about video games and this crazy kid from the sales organization. And after two years, I promise I'm wrapping this part of the story up. After two years, I was listening one day to Scott McNeely uh, doing his 
Sun W radio show every month that would be broadcast, right, through our broadcast or streamed to our desktop machines. And he was talking to one of our incredible chip engineers, Mark Tremblay, about the magic processor. And when are we going to see this in a Sega machine or a PlayStation machine? And it was the only time in my career where I ever picked up all my stuff at 11 o'clock in the morning and walked out of the office because I was so frustrated that nobody would listen to what I was trying to say. They're asking about these game systems two years after I had been trying to get people to listen. So I did the Hail Mary play the next day and wrote Scott this three paragraph long email and sent him a bunch of materials. And a few weeks later, he called me at my desk and he said, I understand you want to talk about video games. What's what's going on? Here's what we're thinking. And I said, no offense, Scott, but the strategy is entirely wrong. Ooh. And I remember the engineer, Neil, sitting next to me in the, in the cube next to me. And he stands up and he goes, what are you doing? I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm going to be fired. <laughs> and to Scott's credit, he said, you know, why do you think it's the wrong strategy? And I spent 30 minutes on the phone with him. Three weeks later, I was at corporate to focus on video games for Sun Microsystems. Was that the start of the game technologies group? So... About two years after that, we assembled the Game Technologies Group. It was really about taking the technologies that some microsystems was creating, which were cross-platform, multi-platform, network-based solutions, and applying those to the issues that game developers have, right? I mean, one of the single biggest problems that game developers have versus any other forms of media is that they are device-centric. Um, They're device-bound. I can record a video or this video that we're doing right now, we can go ahead and package it up and stream it in a myriad of different ways to millions of different devices. And the experience will be ostensibly the same. But we can't do that for video games yet. So it's about empowering developers by giving them tools that allow them to get their games on as many platforms as possible to reach the biggest audience as possible and get their art out into the world. And that has been kind of the entire motivation thesis of my entire career inside the video games industry. It's interesting as you speak about this, this experience of being able to get people on the network. And again, following the moniker, the network is the computer. That's right. Where we're still doing that today. I mean, every once in a while we hear a little hint of cooperative online play between various platforms and it gets people excited because that's the promise and yet that promise has never really been fulfilled there are a few examples but they are by far the uh, the uh, uh, exception not the norm mm -hmm. why is that so difficult um, especially if you've got a developer that might be developing for two three maybe even four platforms why is it so difficult to have some way to unite that online play. What makes that challenge so technical? Because video games are truly the collision of art and technology. And as we continue to push technology forward and find better ways to basically render our world, to create uh, better physics, to trick our brain in, in different ways, um, it requires constantly pushing on that bleeding edge of technology. And it takes time for technology to make its way into the world across all of these devices. What's really interesting, though, is we are now reaching a point in time when web technologies are pervasive enough, tools are inexpensive enough, and platforms are technically capable enough that we're starting to see this possibility now finally happening. When you look at platforms like HTML5 and WebGL and the, the work that's being done by the folks over at Mozilla on this, and as well in the, in the rest of the consortium that is now built up around this, we're now looking at the web as truly a viable platform for delivering video games across a wide variety of devices in just the same way we deliver video and static content today. So it could be that maybe those of us that were focused on this back in the early 2000s, we were just about 15 years too early. But it's nice to see it's coming, it's coming around, right? Right. And I will say that you may have been 15 years too early, but the lessons that you learned and the foundation that you laid is still very, very much valid. It's, it's still being used today and it's still being extrapolated upon by current developers. So, uh, so kudos to you. Now, Chris, uh, we do have to take another break, but when I come back, um, I, I'd love to talk a little bit about 
Project Dark Star. If you're if we're talking about foundation and if we're talking about lessons learned, that has to be part of the conversation. Now, are are you ready to take a trip down memory lane back to the old Dark Star? Absolutely. We'll be right back with Chris Melisinos, but first let's go ahead and take another moment to thank a sponsor of Triangulation. Now, this episode of Triangulation is also brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. The mortgage experience has never been very good. Well, we all understand what it's like. You, know, you, you gather together all your financial records, you go to a bank, you try to convince a person that you're worthy of a loan, that you're a good risk, that of course you're going to pay them back, that you have a good business plan. It's, it's actually a little bit humiliating. So it's strange to think that the mortgage experience hasn't been updated along with our digital lives. Well, at least it wasn't before Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Rocket Mortgage gives you the confidence that you need when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. It's simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident that you're getting the right mortgage for you. It's also convenient. The trust partners allow you to share your financial information with Rocket Mortgage at the touch of a button. It's all online. It, it doesn't involve you gathering together receipts or finding old banker's boxes. It's also powerful. Whether you're looking to buy your first home or your 10th, Rocket Mortgage is able to perform thousands of calculations in seconds. And based on your income, your assets, and your credit, Rocket Mortgage can analyze all of your home loan options for which you qualify. And then you can find the one that's just right for you. Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Apply simply, understand fully, mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. That's rocketmortgage.com slash triangulation. Equal housing lender license in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support of triangulation. We are speaking with Chris Melisinos. He is, uh, I'm going to say it, he is our, our historical knowledge of the development of the video game industry, especially as it applies to the enterprise world. Chris, thank you again for speaking with us. Now, we just had a conversation about what happens when you try to have cross-platform support? What happens when you try to bring developers on board? What happens when you try to expand, excuse me, expand the development in Horizons? Which leads us to Project Dark Star. This was something that, uh, that actually started way back, what, in 1999, but when it came into Sun Microsystems, really kind of blossomed into a strategy for getting multi, mo, mo, massively multiplayer online games out into the world. Tell me, mm -hmm. what was the genesis of Dark Star? Do you mean this Dark Star? Oh my goodness. Oh. Signed by the majority of the team? Oh my, oh my goodness. goodness. Now goodness that's gracious. a collector's item. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Project Dark Star had a really interesting path. So after, you know, as I was saying earlier, when I um, was brought over to focus on video game technology, a lot of the work that we were doing was focused on building, number one, the community, which was at javagaming.org, which still exists today as the largest uh, community for Java game development on the web and is completely community owned and run. So it established itself uh, you know, long enough ago into a solid enough community that we were able to gift them the domain and the properties, and it's completely self-run now by the, the community, which is phenomenal. And then it was also building the client-side technologies in Java for OpenGL access for graphics and OpenAL for audio and input for joysticks and controllers. And then we started turning our attention to the server side. And we were noticing a very disturbing trend with the, with the way massive multiplayer games were built. So for the uninitiated, massively multiplayer online game servers were typically built at what's known as shards. So a company would take a stack of technology, a stack of servers, and you would be able to fit, let's say, 2,000 players inside of this world, the fully encapsulated world of a massive multiplayer game. But if you wanted to bring over the 2,000th and first player, you would need to build a second identical stack of hardware called a shard and put that first player in there. And that one player could not see the other 2,000 players in the identical world sitting right next to it in the data center. And so you continue to build shard after shard after shard, which led to some very obvious problems. Scalability issues, not being able to play with your friends, having to buy too much equipment to stand up a game and basically could cause the company to go out of business because if the player base dropped low enough, they'd be paying for hardware that was never being used. 
So we started saying there has to be a way to apply what we know about building highly scalable, fault tolerant, horizontally scaling systems that provide one common server backend for any type of game. And this was the origin, the genesis of Project Darkstar, was to create a truly horizontally scaling platform. And you know, the question I used to ask people all the time is, do you know what the largest massive multiplayer game in the world is? Wall Street trading systems. <laughs> it's that, right? Yes, so you, this is true. Right? So if you think about, if you talk to a trader at the end of the day, what's their goal? To have the highest score at the end of each day. And they are working on millions and millions of transactions faster and that require more security and reliability than pretty much anything we see in the consumer world. Sun Microsystems was at the core of building those types of platforms for decades. So let's go apply with what we know to what we want to go ahead and improve and see how we can marry them. And that's how we started down the road to build Project Dark Star. Uh, you've summarized it very succinctly, but um, I, I don't know if some people really understand how revolutionary this was. For those mm -hmm. of us who, who tried using massive online systems back in the day, we would always run into problems with zone overloading, with data syncing, data corruption, and as you mentioned, server underutilization. This, this was in the days before we really thought of these resources as dynamically allocated. We bought them and they were spun up and they were ready to be used and then maybe no one ever touched them. Uh, that was just one of the risks of doing business. And so Project Darkstar, I remember when I read up on this, well, when I was still, uh, uh, I was still in schooling, um, it, it gave me the option as a developer to start thinking of my development not in the terms of boxes that I would spin up, but in terms of worlds. I created a world and then I just gave it a pile of resources that that world could pull from. And that, that was such a seismic shift in development. A and to your credit, it really stuck with the Sun Microsystems mantra of the the network is the computer if the network is my computer then i don't have to worry about individual boxes i just make sure that they're communicating properly um correct that, and that became once sun microsystem was sold to oracle project uh was it red dwarf server Th does that take all of the same aspects of dark star and just make it more modern or, or was it really a branching off so when we launched Project Darkstar, it was really launched again into the community. And there were some commercial products that wound up utilizing it. Um, inside of Sun Labs, which is where Project Darkstar was built. Now, remember, while I'm happy to be the evangelist for these things, I'm happy to talk about why it's so important. There were many men and women that actually built the platform. Uh, the lab director, Carl Harbel, who I worked very closely with, Jeff Kesselman, who was the very first, uh, who created the very first implementation of this, Dr. Jim Waldo, who was one of the guys behind Corba, um, who basically led the engineering side of this. So in, some incredibly talented, some of the best and brightest minds in the space were working on this thing. And our goal was to always make sure that it was an open platform, that people could go ahead and get access to it and use it, whether you were a two-person company or you know, a publicly traded uh, video game company. And in fact, we built another uh, platform. There was another group inside of Sun Labs that was working on Project Wonderland, which was a business-oriented virtual reality or, or um, uh, virtual space for, uh, for interaction. Think sort of second life, but really in a business context. So if you walked up to a picture inside of this virtual world and that picture looked like a Windows desktop, it was actually a live Windows desktop being streamed into the world that you could operate virtually from inside of this 3D space. And so Project Darkster was the platform on the back of that. When Sun Microsystems was sold to Oracle and the company transitioned over, it was a technology that just didn't fit the type of markets that um, Oracle had aligned themselves with. And so they allowed for that technology to live on under a different name and basically uh, delivered directly as a community supported and built platform. And that's just kind of where it existed until, well, I'm sure there's a community that's still using it today, but that was pretty much the end of the commercial development of Project Darkstar. Right, right. And I, I don't think this interview would be complete without us talking a little bit 
about Oracle. It, it's very easy to say, oh, Oracle destroyed so much of the magic that I remember as a child and as a young adult that Sun Microsystems created. But this is the industry in which we, we live, in which we work, and we understand that business is business. Uh, Oracle just made the step of open sourcing Java, uh, essentially saying, okay, it's enjoy, it's out in the world. What mm -hmm. What is your sense of how the Sun Microsystems legacy is going to live on? I mean, I remember it, you remember it, our generation rem remembers it, but uh, unless people are studying the history of Sun, they may not realize how much Sun and its engineers added to the interactive world that we live in today. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I can't speak for Oracle and I, you know, um, as, as I'm not there, right? But I do remember what it was like when Oracle first bought the company. And, you know, Sun, Sun was a once in a generation company. Mm -hmm. Truly, the, it was it didn't matter what group you worked in. It didn't matter the kind of projects you were you were you were you were building or focused on. There was this incredible shared sense of purpose that permeated through every level of the company. You know, when you have a CEO that would walk into any meeting, regardless of the level that you were, in jeans and sneakers, insist that you call him by his nickname Scooter, and just go, "Come on, let's go ahead and." Uh, run, let's go visit one of your customers. Let's get in your car and go and go out there and, and be in touch. I mean, it was just, it was a different era of company and it was a different way of, of thinking about the world. But Sun eventually fell to a lot of the things that companies that are um, engineering focused and are, and are visionary can succumb to, which is, are we building the things that people actually want or can use in their life versus just amazing technology? What are really the threats that are happening in the world that could impact the incredible things that we're doing today? Not from any fault of the technology or the software or the hardware or anything that we were building, but just because those things no longer fit the world in the way, in the way it was progressing. And so every company has to be cautious of this, yeah. right? That it's one thing to go ahead and build and, and, and I love to do it and I spent five years in Sun Labs, but we have to make sure that what we build is, uh, is applicable in the world. You know, and I've always lived by the mantra that technology without a human connection isn't worth developing, right? Because at the end of the day, the technology has to go ahead and serve humanity. It has to go ahead and serve the, the consumer, the people that rely upon it to, to live their lives. And so, you know, Oracle went ahead and grabbed the best and brightest uh, of Sun, grabbed some amazing product, turned it into even better product and continued to move that forward, right? But these are all just shifting parts of a massively and rapidly expanding technology landscape. So, you know, it's, uh, it's funny. When I left Sun, I, I often said I went through like this four or five year divorce. I don't think I've, I'll ever completely work out the the Sun Microsystems from who I am because again it was the most amazing transformative technology company that I'd ever uh, been a part of. It was uh, truly a privilege to to have worked there. And and really, that's my memories of Sun. Uh, that it was creating some incredible technologies that I thought, wow, I want to see that in the future. I want to see what that mm -hmm. develops into. And it's also one of the prototype failures of the Silicon Valley in that they were making such wonderful stuff, no one stopped to ask, are people ready to buy this? Will this keep the doors open? Uh, right. And you could look at companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, just go down the line of innovators in the Silicon Valley and, and beyond. And I think every single one of them had to look at Sun and say, okay, we need to balance this. We need to have mm -hmm. something like a Skunk Works, like they had at Sun. We need to look at those incredible technologies, but th at the same time, make sure that we're not hurting the bottom line. Uh, and that's an incredibly sure. difficult balance, balance to pull. And you're right, maybe, just, maybe Sun just had one quarter, two quarters, maybe one year, two years, too much of, of head in the clouds attitude. You know, and that's the thing. If you go up and down the valley and you go to any of these major companies, you'll find Sun people from all mm. levels continuing to work today and continue to bring forward the same spirit of camaraderie, the same spirit of, of innovation and forward thinking vision that really ignited the company at the, at the time that it did and still bringing those same lessons forward. You know, again, it, um, you know, a, a, as you said, if you're not careful, 
uh, this is what winds up happening. And every company, you know, you, you look at, at the companies that have sustained longer than Sun, they've had to all make foundational transformative pivots from where they were to where they were going. And sometimes it could be extraordinarily painful. We've seen more companies falter doing this and we've seen succeed, right? Um, but the lessons that we took away from working there, you think about the people that, that built that company, you know, Bill Joy, uh, Vinod Kosla, uh, Andy Bechtelsheim, Scott McNeely, John Gage, uh, you know, uh, John Fowler, Jonathan Schwartz. I mean, like the list goes on and on and on of people that were working on three, four, five different disciplines that the world had never uh, thought to go ahead and build against. It was an extraordinary period of time in which to live and experience and, and be part of that company. I have a good friend who was a, a Sun engineer. And even to this day, he tells me there are some things that he saw in the lab that his colleagues were working on that would still be considered futuristic and advanced today. Uh, which Absolutely. I, I, I wish I could have a time machine and just jump back in that lab and, and, and take a look at, at uh, you know, where we're going. Yeah. We figured so out by a, country, a company almost two decades ago. Yeah. All right. So think about it this way. Um, there was a product that was created um, called Black Box. I don't know if you recall this, uh, th th this device or th this platform, but basically... Sun had the thought of taking a giant shipping container oh, yes, yes. and putting an entire data center in it that's completely water-cooled. And so what would wind up happening is if there was a natural disaster, we could go ahead and bring an entire data center on premise using utilizing the same infrastructure that is used to transport diapers, right? <laughs> Toilet paper, beans, and, and these sorts of things, which is railway system and rail cars. So it was taking a look at that at our world, understanding the tools within it, and figuring out what we could do to innovate on top of it that would be truly transformative. Now, in a way, if you listen to Jeff Bezos talk, and he, he's asked, uh, I've heard him ask this question uh, of, "Hey, Jeff, you know, how do you predict the future?" And his comment was, and I'm paraphrasing here, was, "It's kind of impossible to predict the future. So let's look at what people will always want to do." And how do we go ahead and make that better? It's the same sort of thing that Sun was doing since its inception, right? From figuring out how to go ahead and build cheap enough systems to get uh, college students time sharing on compute university networks from their dorm room to building mobile data centers that are completely water-cooled inside of shipping container crates. Sun was just an amazing force of innovation, technology progression that it's fair to say Without their leadership, we would not know the World Wide Web as we do today. And of course, 10 years later, Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook, and uh, Google all released wonderful breakthroughs in technology, which were data centers and shipping containers. So <laughs> congratulations, Simon. Yeah. <laughs> congratulations. <laughs> okay. Exactly. Uh, oh, Chris, it's not just about programming and projects with you. Uh, there's also what I would consider a very personal gift that you are giving back to the video game generation. I, I, I do want to talk a little bit about past pixels. Is, is that okay? When we come back, can we, can we jump sure. into the art of the video game? That would be wonderful. We, of course, are speaking with Chris Melsinos. He is, uh, he is our institutional memory for how the video game industry has affected all of us. If you're watching this on the internet right now, if you are enjoying online video gaming, or if you just like the art of the video game industry, you're going to want to stay tabbed. But first, let's go ahead and take a break to thank a sponsor of Triangulation. Now, we all need a presence on the internet. We know this. If you're going to do business today, if you're going to relate to people, an online presence is, well, that's table stakes, folks. But maybe you're not a designer. Maybe you're not an artist. Maybe you don't really have an eye for putting together a, an entrancing website, which is why we are so happy to have WordPress as a sponsor of Triangulation. Now, your business needs an online home. It needs WordPress.com. You don't need prior experience. You don't need to hire someone to do it for you. WordPress.com guides you through the entire process. Every day, millions of people go online to search for local businesses. Does your small business show up? When you create a website on WordPress.com, you can make it easy for your customers to find you, to connect with you, and hear how you can help them. 
You can boost your visibility with built-in search engine optimization and social sharing. You can activate other WordPress plugins for the functionality your business needs. And with a WordPress.com plan, expert support is always there to help you focus on what matters, growing your business. You can create your WordPress.com site and you'll see why. Get started today with 15% off any new plan purchase. Just go to WordPress.com slash triangulation to create your website and find the plan that's right for you. Again, that's WordPress.com slash triangulation for 15% off your brand new website. And we thank WordPress for their support of triangulation. Again, we are speaking with Chris Melisinos. He is now going to take us into the past of pixels. Uh, Chris, is it, is it fair to say that past pixels was your love child? That is a fair statement. <laughs> that is quite a fair statement. So, um, so Past Pixels was a company that I started actually to uh, focus on one very specific thing, which was to um, act as the vehicle that allowed me to do the work in starting in 2009 with the Smithsonian American Art Museum in building the art of video games at the American Art Museum in Washington, D.C., and of course, you know, as we were just talking about Sun Microsystems, were it not for Sun, I would not have been in the position to do this work. Right. And of course, the art of the video game, um, it ran at the Smithsonian Art Museum from, I believe, March 16, 2012 to September. So it's about a six month run. And yeah. even by today's standard, it was amazingly successful. Attracted more than 23,000 visitors on the opening weekend, almost 700,000 visitors in a six-month run. It is still one of the most successful exhibits ever in the history of the Smithsonian. And really what it did was, and I believe this is one of the mission statements of Past Pixel, to dedicate the long-term preservation of video games as artifacts of the video game generation. Now, what... What kind of pushback do you get? Because I know there are people out there who, when you say the art of the video game, kind of roll their eyes and say, so a bunch of graphics, a bunch of blocks, a bunch of colored pixels. How do you convince people that this is an art worth, artwork that is worthy of preservation? So, yeah, right. That's, that's the, the really the difficult question, but it's really not so difficult to answer anymore. Right. We look at the fact that video gamers in the United States average age being 37 years old, when, as we were talking about earlier, most of us that grew up in the 1970s that uh, were first introduced to video games, we may have stopped playing them for a period of time. Not me, of course, but <laughs> um, right, many people had stopped playing, but then they're reintroduced uh, to them. And it brings back all these incredible memories of growing up with uh, with games in their lives. Right. Um, the the answer becomes and the acceptance of the answer becomes easier you know as more years go by but back in 2009 i was invited to the smithsonian as the chief evangelist at sun microsystems and um was invited along with about 20 or so other um technologists from across the computer industry from microsoft to myspace and facebook and and all of us there to spend three days with a bunch of curators and talk to them about technology and how to utilize technology to speak to younger audiences that continue to come in. And I remember sitting in the plenary session and uh, all these, uh, you know, my, my colleagues, very nice people, all of them uh, were saying, oh, you need to do more blogs and you need to, you know, uh, do more podcasts. And I said, look, I disagree with just about everybody up here. I've just spent, you know, three days with curators and what you want to do is curate. But what you need to understand is that every weekday you have busloads of kids coming into your museums. And where do they live? They live in their iPhone. They live in their Nintendo DSs. They live in their PlayStation portables. Remember the time this was, right, 2009. Right, right. And I said, so you can't expect them to play in your you know, playground. You need to play in theirs. How do you reach them and communicate to them in a language that they understand, a language they live in? So they brought me back in and said, well, what about video games? You seem to have kind of, uh, you know, a passion for this. I said, well, where do you want to start? So I came in and spoke to the head of the American Art Museum, Betsy Brune at the time. And uh, what was supposed to be a 30-minute meeting turned into three hours. And I had to constantly go out to the street in D.C. to feed the meter so I wouldn't get a ticket there. And I said, okay, okay, you're thinking really big. So let's figure out something that the Smithsonian can actually kind of wrap their arms around. And I spent 
about six to eight months or so, going in meeting after meeting, convincing the Smithsonian American Art Museum that video games are an art form. And right after that period, they commissioned me to build the art of video games with my colleague, Georgina Goodlander at the museum. And we were off. One of my favorite quotes was from an article that uh, you had in Time, September 22nd of 2015. And I quote, video games are the only form of media that allow for personalizing the artistic experience while still retaining the authority of the artist. In video games, we find three distinct voices, the creator, the game, and the player. Those who play a game are following the story of the author and are bound by the construct of the rules, but based on the choices they make, the experience can be completely personal. If we can observe the work of another and find in it personal connection, then art has been achieved. And I love that because that's exactly the experience that I have when I go into an art gallery. You sit down, you enjoy something that someone else has created, but... Right you're not just memorizing what they did, there is a sense that is evoked. And that's exactly what happens in a video game. And no two people who play a video game are gonna have the same sense evoked. So that makes it art, right? I mean, if, if I can have that, the same that I, I do when I go into an art gallery, then nothing separates it. It's not, it's not a lesser form of art, it's just a different art. That's exactly right. And I also realized I didn't really answer your question. The answer that I give people all the time is, how can you say video games are not art when video games are the collision of art and science? Every form of art that we hold up individually can be expressed in a video game. In games, we find illustration and painting and sculpture, narration, orchestration. Again, we can hold up a sculpture and put it on a pedestal and go, hmm, this is art. Those exist inside of games. We can listen to an orchestral score at, um, you know, in a uh, in a venue, and go, wow! Listen to the the beauty of that orchestra playing. We hear that in in video games today. So, video games are more than just the sum of their parts, because, or rather, yeah, greater than the sum of their parts, because it is through the combination of these individual forms of art that they become something else entirely. And that art emerges through the playing of the games, just as you said, right? Um, it is playing through them and having my own personal perspective, being able to imbue with my own sense of morality, with um, a, a position that I may want to take while still retaining the authority of the game author or designer who has a story they want to tell. They start you where they want to start you. They end you where they want to end you. But along the way, you get to make these small choices that personalized experience for you. And that's what makes video games, as I've said many times before, one of the most important art forms that we have ever had at our disposal at any point in our entire humanity. We have Reverb Mike in our chat room who is asking, is this poetry? And I think actually that might be the most apt description I can think of. As you mentioned, you are, you are combining so many different artistic visions from the music to the visuals to the uh, the story itself and to the experience of the player there's nothing else that does it quite like a video game and it is a poetry it's it's something that's designed to to be different every time it's read every time it's played through mm -hmm. it's it's something that grows with the experience of of the player um and mm -hmm. it's amazing I, I i remember i just what three weeks ago um, I happened to go back home uh, to the East Bay and I found a pizza shop that I remembered as a kid. So I went in and had a horrible slice of pizza and they had the same Cubert arcade game I remembered from when I was a teenager and it was still there. And I said, okay, I dropped, a, I dropped two quarters in because now they're 50 cents for some reason. I don't understand that. But I'm playing Cubert and I'm thinking, <laughs> this brings me back to my teenage years. And it's not just me remembering this here, it's me remembering about all the things that happened the last time I played this game. That, that is the most powerful art you can experience. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Absolutely, so this is a question that I love to ask people, uh, especially during interviews, right? So I'd love to try this experiment with you, if, if you're willing. Oh, of course. Okay, can you tell me the very first video game system you had in your home? A console or like just a video game system? What do you remember most vividly? Uh, probably the uh, the Trash 80. 
Okay. Where was that trash 80 in your house? It was in the very lowest floor in the den under a bunch of boxes. Okay. Do you remember where it was in the, it was under the box. Do you remember where it was in the room, like which wall it was against and oh, what of course. was kind it of was around it? The furthest wall from the door, uh, the, the boxes above it, there was a yellow box and a blue box that I just kind of used to keep the sun from hitting that little black and white TV that I had hooked into it. It was a black and white TV that I had found while dumpster diving. Um, I had a bunch of uh, shipping blankets that I had put down so that I could play for long hours at a time without being disturbed or, or being uh, upset by the, the hardwood floor. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's incredibly vivid. If I start thinking about it, I can, I can tell you exactly what divots were in the walls because I, I would like lean back and, and hit something with a chair. Yep. So you've basically cut to the, directly the end of my question. So my question for you now is, can you tell me all of the same detail about your favorite book, about your favorite album or your favorite movie? No. Like where you experienced them? Probably now, not. <laughs> right. So so what typically happens is people can kind of get a little bit. They go, well, I remember I remember where I was when I got the wall, right? The, the, uh, right. the wall right. album, Pink Floyd. But I couldn't really tell you who was around me, what the floor looked like, what the room smelled like, all these things. Because again, as I said before, video games should not exist. They are, they represent a, each one represents a universe that is not here. It's not one that we can experience in our physical space. And so you are literally looking through a portal into another universe that you can affect, right? That can communicate with you. And so it's more than just playing the game. It's everything around it. It's the physicality of the machine, where you were, who you were with, the experience that you had goes into those memories. And this is why it's so extraordinarily powerful as an artistic tool, as an educational tool. Um, and we're just, I mean, it, they're only 45 years young, really. So we're <laughs> just now, you know, at 40, they existed for a single generation of people. What other transformative communication or art form has ever existed in 45 years that has ensnared the entire imagination of a planet? There isn't one just isn't. Yeah. And I think that just speaks to the power of the medium. It, it really does. The, the fact that you are, you are involving so many senses at the same time. Again, nothing like it. Nothing like it. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. We, Chris, we are way over time, but I, I do, I do want to end on a discussion about that transformative nature of video games, because there is another layer here, even beyond that, uh, that article that you you had in 2015. And, and that is right now, you are the uh, director of corporate strategy for media and entertainment at Verizon. And there's a very good reason for that. And that is, that's another level. You talked mm -hmm. about how there were at least three different artistic visions inside of a video game. You've got the author and you've got the game itself and you've got the player. Is there another now when we start taking everything online? I mean, there's a reason why you're at Verizon. Sure. There's a reason why they've, they've brought your talents in because they, they recognize that the connected experience, the, the always online experience can add yet another voice or yet another series of voices to the, to the video game experience. In your mind, is the future of video games to be always connected and always evolving based on what other people are doing? I think that, um, that connectivity is now an inextricable part of what video games will mean and how we apply them to everything from entertainment to serious social discourse to education. Um, at the end of the day, what's important to remember is all of the investment that, you know, that large companies make in everything from communication platforms to um, game technologies and tools really serve one thing, which is to resonate with the people that depend on them. That, re that in some way makes their lives better, in some way connects people to, to each other to better understand our world, to better understand each other's perspectives, to be able to play together, to learn together, to communicate. And so um, these, yes, the, the future of games exists online. Now, if you, you know, if I'm speaking personally, 
Um, I don't play as many online games as I used to because, you know, time, life, all these other sorts of things kind of take over. And so I wind up playing more solitary. But I find that the times I choose to play online and I choose to reach out to my friends and play and know that they're there, whether they're in like my friend Mark up in Seattle, my friend Pat in L.A., and we would get together and play online. Um, the fact that we're able to do so from across the country and have a meaningful um, experience together is an incredible gift. And it depends on the, uh, you know, the incredible investments in technology, the operation of these platforms to ensure that we have that human connection, that we are able to reach out and experience these things with each other. Again, to you know, uh, better understand our increasingly shrinking world to better communicate with each other and to connect and get better perspective than we ever had before. You know, we go all the way back to, as you and I were talking about at the beginning of this show, in the 1980s and 70s, our world was the neighborhood that we lived in. You know, growing up in New York, it's how many blocks could I walk before it got dark, before I had to come home again? That was the world that I inhabited. Once I found my way online to discover an entire world of people that thought the way I did, or maybe provided me with a different perspective that expanded beyond the borders of the city blocks that I grew up in was a transformative and pivotal moment. And our kids are growing up today in a world that will be forever connected. Now, there are challenges that we're going to face along the way, obviously. The world has only really been living with the World Wide Web as they know it since about 1994. And in that period of time, it has fundamentally transformed every facet of life in nearly every corner of our planet. So I'd say on the whole, we're all doing pretty good, right, with the technology. We're doing pretty good with these platforms and understanding how to best utilize them. And we'll just get better over time. Video games are one of the ways we're able to get people interested in technology, seamlessly connect, um, break down the fear of technology and, and connection and discourse. And we're just going to continue that way. I think right now, taking it all the way back to games, it is the absolute greatest period of time to be in game development or playing those games, right? Democratization of information, commoditization of technology means that inspired works are going to come from all corners of the planet. And that, connective, that connectivity is going to allow us to experience the breadth of what humanity has to offer. That is amazing, right? That is really what the internet was, or <laughs> that is it, the internet serving its greatest purpose. We have been speaking with Christopher Melisinos. He is the Director of Corporate Strategy for Media and Entertainment at Verizon. Chris, this has been an incredible honor. Thank you so very much for spending time with our audience. Thank you for sharing your experience at Sun with the early game, video game industry at Verizon. If you could, if you could tell our audience where they could find more about you, more about Past Pixels, perhaps where they might find uh, snippets of your work online so that they can check out your history and your past and our future. Oh, fantastic. And again, it was my pleasure being on the show. Thank you for having me. You can reach me uh, through Twitter at C. Melisinos. Uh, you can find me on my website at chrismelisinos.com. Best way to go ahead and reach out to me. And I uh, would love to hear from anyone that's watching and uh, your thoughts on games and how amazing they are. And uh, again, it was wonderful being on your program. Thank you so much for having me on today. Again, Chris Melisinos, we thank you for joining us for Triangulation. My pleasure. And also thanks to you to the people who watch this show every week, who download it into your devices of choice. We get to interview the luminaries of the tech world because of your attention and because you come back each and every single week. And we want to make sure that you can get all of the triangulation that you can handle. Just make sure you go to our show page at twit.tv slash triangulation. There you will find all of our previous episodes hosted by so many different pieces of talent here at the Twit TV studios, as well as a subscribe menu. That's right, you can drop down and automatically get an audio version, a video version, or a high definition video version into the device of your choice so you never miss triangulation. Don't forget that we tape this show every Monday morning, 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific time. You could watch us live.twit.tv. And as long as you're watching live, why not jump into our chat room at irc.twit.tv. Next week, we've got Jason Howell back to interview yet another interesting guest for Triangulation. Until then, 
I'm Father Robert Palliser, the digital Jesuit, thanking you for watching Triangulation.